I have the great pleasure to introduce Alan Weltstein to you. And um, for many of you, he needs little introduction, I know. He's an English professor at the University of Montana West in Dillon. Western, excuse me. Uh, and um, he's the author of many books, prose and poetry and especially is well known for his Norman Maclean reader, which fits his metier pretty well because he's a great champion of Montana writers, notably McCain and Thomas Savage. He has also co-edited The Art and Activism of Rick Bass and the work coming into McPhee country. Alan skis in the winter and scrambles peaks in the summer. So he's a devoted mountaineer, by the way. So without more ado, I give you youthful Alan Welson. Good morning. Uh, I get to introduce my uh, friends on this panel, and I'm, uh, I'll do that before I start my talk. So uh, actually, Bill Beavis doesn't need any, any introduction, particularly in Missoula. I, I do, but uh, he doesn't. Um, so he's been a friend and mentor of mine for 20 or 25 years, and I used to think he is Mr. Montana literary critic. A few of us, uh, others of us have uh, said uh, work in, in that ten territory that he frankly set up in his book called Ten Tough Trips. And in Ten Tough Trips occurs one of the first and best uh, readings of Norman MacLean. If you haven't read this book and you like Montana literature, you need to read this book. But Bill has also written a cool historical novel, and I took a class to uh, Death Valley National Park. I haven't even told you that, but uh, last year for several days I faked and made up a class about deserts and literature. And, and I recommend Shorty Harris to you a lot. He's also an accomplished uh, nonfiction writer. He wrote a very cool book called Borneo Log uh, that comes from some adventures that he and Juliet had in, uh, in Sarawak. Uh, the northern part of Borneo Island. And he still skis faster than I do, that's for sure. But, and I'm not a bad skier. So that's maybe uh, all I will say right now about Bill. We got to serve on the uh, board of Humanities Montana together. And uh, that experience, for me at least, uh, reminded me that, that Bill is one of the most, uh, in, uh, one of the smartest and most articulate friends I have anywhere. So. Uh, and he sure did help the, uh, the cause of Humanities Montana. Shout out to Humanities Montana, who, by the way, are one of the, so the sponsors of this second Norman McLean Festival. The other panelist is a newer friend of mine. Uh, we've been email friends for, what, a couple years, I think? And uh, so Tim Schilling, as some of you may have heard, or if you read the Missoulian, uh, ha has traveled the farthest of anyone who is on the program, as far as I can tell. Uh, Tim comes from Washington State, as I do. He, though, took quite a different path after his English undergraduate degree, and in fact, he's a Catholic theologian who lives and works in Utrecht in the Netherlands. But he, uh, he also writes a lot of, uh, of stories, essays, for lots of different kinds of journals, and he's written at least two uh, essays on, on Norman, uh, emphasizing, as he will this morning, some of the spiritual dimensions of, of the work. Before I, uh, w uh, one other preamble, I just wanted to give another shout out to Jenny Rohrer, who does unbelievable work to put this festival together. Uh, 
I got to be in on the first festival, perhaps more than I should have. And uh, I have some appreciation for the amount of work that she and uh, some of the dedicated Sealy team, who I consider good friends of mine for various reasons over several years, what they have put together to, to do this thing. Because this gives people like me a chance to uh, come back to one of the writers I, I love the most. I would also give a shout out to John McLean, who's been a friend of mine for a long time now, and to G his sister, Jean Snyder, who I don't think is here yet. Uh, for helping to uh, sort of be the spiritual parents of this, uh, if you'll forgive that phrase, John, for this conference and uh, this attention on Norman. And I wanted to give a shout out to Anik, who I don't know if she's here yet either. Uh, the focus on the Big Blackfoot River in particular, the Headwaters uh, anthology, the number of, of uh, really impressive writers, many of whom I consider pretty good friends who are part of that. Uh, and for her own work and example, uh, advocating for the Big Blackfoot River for, what, 40 years or something like that. So I'll get started now. Uh, I'm going to focus this morning on the concept of reading the waters. And ultimately, I want to especially look at a few pages in the middle of uh, A River Runs Through It. And these few pages, if you're interested, is pages 61 to 63. Uh, that uh, I have long considered one of the best sections of a, of a perfect book. And I want to talk a little this morning about something that's uh, fascinated me for a long time, and that's just the notion of reading rivers. But I need to confess that I'm a terrible fly fisherman. I've been intimidated uh, of my quarter century in Montana by particularly students, men and women, who seem to be really, really good at it. And I'm not, although I have fly fished a few times. Uh, I fear, though, that I would be one of those people whom Norman looked at, let's say from a bridge, and he's looking down, and there I am, and he's looking down, and he says, and maybe some of you have heard this before, he says, now who's that poor bastard down there waving a wand? <laughs> then there's five seconds of silence. Then you hear C minus. <laughs> uh, perhaps this is true, what I'm about to say for many of you, as it is for me. Reading constitutes probably my most fundamental activity. It's probably what defines me most as being human, uh, particularly since, in my case, age 10, when I turned into a hardcore bookworm and I've never looked back. I still read a lot more than I write, I read hours a day. Uh, sleep's overrated, or at least at my age it seems to be. I've taught critical reading most all of my career. And by reading, I want that notion to have some, uh, some semantic edge so that it isn't completely uh, sort of loose and uh, uh, applicable to any number of things. But I, I would propose that reading is, uh, is one of our most fundamental acts of interpretation, and that in that process of interpreting, we collect our intellectual, our affective, and our spiritual responses into patterns, into patterns of meaning, in fact. And <clears throat> let's see, that's enough of that. <laughs> so reading the waters, there's nothing new in our uh, world about this ancient habit. Obviously, this belongs to mariners uh, for millennia. Uh, it's true as well with rivers, of course, whether one sails, rows, or fishes. In the U.S. literary history, though, uh, I'm sort of jerking towards the Mississippi River, uh, since that's uh, our central geographical and mythological river in the United States, at least in American literary history. And as you may remember, Mark Twain sang this river as no one else has. He's our definitive example of, of a writer, uh, what, beholding and trying to interpret what a river means. I imagine there's no disagreement about the notion that in our state, in big smoke country, uh, Norman, I'm glad you like that, my, my retitling, uh, the Big Blackfoot River has come to have that same status. And it is, of course, because of Norman McLean. It is the literary river that runs through big smoke country. Uh, I want to speak a little bit about Mark Twain then to get to Norman and to get to this scene. So Mark Twain, or as you may remember, Samuel Clemens, he interrupted the 
early stages of writing his masterpiece, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, to write a nonfiction book. Uh, and in that nonfiction book, he, he just glanced back one generation in his own career and in his own life uh, to recall in detail and to celebrate his work, his years, seasons as a cub pilot on the Mississippi River. He published what was first called Old Times on the Mississippi. And years later, he expanded that a lot, and it became Life on the Mississippi, which was published in 1883, interestingly, just one to two years before the serial publication of the big one. And I think there's more than a casual relationship in Twain's biography to his going exploring his own past based on our most mythological river and the creation or the completion of his masterpiece. Uh, you may know that uh, actually Mark Twain got his, uh, took on his uh, pen name from his cub pilot days, Mark Twain, that is to say. Uh, and that's, that occurred in the years immediately before the Civil War. So in Life on the Mississippi, he goes into loving detail about some of the challenges of reading the water when paddling, uh, sorry, when piloting a paddle wheeler. And he served under uh, Captain Horace Bixby, his mentor, who gets lovingly recreated, particularly in the, first of the early chapters of Life on the Mississippi. Under Bixby's eye, Twain learns the variable language of the big river. The, its rising and falling waters, eddies, flows, its broad range of obstacles, the eternal contest between steam engine and the river's flow. Twain's account of his decoding the Mississippi, of becoming himself a master of its ever-changing waters, is in my mind the most famous account in American literature of reading a river. But Twain isn't fishing. Anyone who fishes, river fishes for very long has become a student, something like the young Twain aboard Captain Bixby's paddle wheeler. And the, pur uh, the purposes of reading have shifted, which means that to some extent, the habits of scanning surface and below and of invoking one's total experience of rivers changes a bit. So we're not worrying about a giant boat with an engine. We're trying to, as Paul McLean says, think like a trout, and therefore anticipate the relation, the relationship of riffles to pools to brush bank, et cetera, et cetera. Most people know, know that even if they don't fly fish much, like Weltsing. But those who fish a lot read where trout might hover or hunker down because they surmise where the fish won't be. So now turning to river. In the middle of river, McLean famously pauses and in just a few pages conjoins Christian theology, in so many ways the thematic basis of the novella and literary criticism. I've always thought it's an exquisite passage, as good as anything in the novella. And I want to turn to this pause in the fishing and in the story to celebrate the conjunction. And now I will stand guilty as charged, uh, if you were here to hear Dick Manning's uh, uh, extraordinary talk yesterday, now I'm stringing together a few of Norman's sentences and I'm very painfully aware of the gap between his and mine, or at least of my utterances. So we'll pick up the passage where, as you remember, Norman and Paul, because of uh, the Neil, the loser brother-in-law's gross tardiness, find themselves fishing in the heat of the day. Norman, as the narrator, famously remarks, he stopped fishing right now. On the river, the heat mirages danced with each other, and then they joined hands and danced through each other, and then they joined hands and danced around each other. Eventually, the watcher joined the river, and there was only one of us. I believe it was the river, end quote. Tim Schilling has pointed out the symbolic associations of this river with the Holy Spirit, citing a half dozen scriptural references. He's also suggested, at least to me, that this lyrical moment reflects a bit of perichoresis. Is that how you pronounce that? Perichoresis, that is, the spiritual dance of the Holy Trinity. 
He defines perichoresis as the, quote, dynamic interpersonal relationship of the three divine persons of the Holy Trinity, end quote. After all, the last chapter of the Bible, the 22nd chapter of the book of Revelations, promises paradise as water, quote, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, unquote. So it turns out a river runs through paradise. McLean's dance, into which the narrator gets absorbed, is an archetypal Christian dance as well, with the promise of ultimate bliss clinging to it. But it's also a classic statement of American literary transcendentalism. Waldo Emerson in Nature famously declared the goal of the self to become a transparent eyeball beholding the universe. This passage in River represents a touchstone in place-based writing, which has obsessed me for much of my career as professor and writer. Place-based writing always stalks the relationship or the marriage between the human self and specific topography, outdoors location, or neighborhood. McLean achieves a sense of fusion, of union, always the goal of transcendentalism, in which the self seeks to overcome her sense of isolation through experiences, sorry, through experiences of imaginative transport and unity. It's a mystical oneness, ever sought and elusive, and when temporarily reached, ecstatic. After all, eventually all things merge into one. McLean is a direct descendant and proponent of American transcendentalism, a fundamental disposition of romantic, capital R, romantic sensibility. But perhaps the greatest texture of the novella consists in the ways in which it archetypally defines human life as a river. This is an ancient and abiding trope that McLean reanimates from his title on. After all, our bodies are mostly water, though our waters don't flow or descend because of gravity and geology. During this episode of transport, of Norman becoming at one with Big Blackfoot, the family symbolic center, McLean perfectly conjoins his story with his definition of art and his own praxis, particularly since he states that fishing and storytelling both require adept, if not expert, reading the water. After all, his anatomy of the river, that is of the dry channel where the river used to run, becomes the same issue as his anatomy of his past, meaning the life meaning in part the life and premature death of his younger brother. The novella itself spans the river that is Paul's life, as well as his brother's. McLean brings in this scene at the center the waters of memory to understand and redeem Paul's sometimes wild life and violent death. In case a first-time reader doesn't know where this sibling story is going, McLean tips his hand and acknowledges what for him, as a formal neo-Aristotelian, represents the highest of uh, what represents uh, the highest form of literature, which is tragedy. He reminds us of dry river channels as a figure for mortality. Quote, part of the way to come to know a thing is through its death. I've said many times before that it took Norman about 35 years and most of his career, to come to the point of writing Paul's story, to finally accept and celebrate it. This center eddy in the river that is the novella contains one of McLean's finest statements about the redemption of art, about the ways in which literary art, for example, polishes and reshapes the messiness of life lived into something enduring and beautiful. There's that un-Presbyterian word that reappears in river. I've always been in love with and have written about this formal aesthetic statement near the beginning of USFS 1919, what I've always called Norman's other novella. And I'll just read my favorite sentence on page 127. I had as yet 
no notion that life, every now and then, becomes literature. Not for long, of course, but long enough to be what we best remember, and often enough so that what we eventually come to mean by life are those moments when life, instead of going sideways, backwards, forward, or nowhere at all, lines out straight, tense, and inevitable, with a complication, climax, and given some luck, a purgation, as if life had been made and not happened. I could blather for the next hour about that, but I tried to do some of that in the Norma MacLean reader, so I'll spare you. The, but that definition of the poet as a maker or artificer dis precisely describes MacLean's particular aesthetic, his particular transformation of autobi autobiography into autobiographical fiction that is, uh, marks his work and, and locates it in a space that I don't know that many other writers occupy, exactly that, that space that he has. And it defines the novella in which it appears. That same, or that comparable statement in River is slightly briefer, and if anything, more stunning. You recall the moment when the narrator signals that, the, that art, or a river runs through it, begins, so to speak, near or at a river's headwaters, quote, near the sound of water. This is comparable to the beginning of one's life, of course, as we issue from the womb's water. But story remakes life, and in a potent way, lessens the dead because they're no longer departed with the same finality. Story brings the dead back. Quote, and I sensed that ahead I would meet something that would never erode, so there would be a sharp turn, deep circles, a deposit, and quietness. That's one of the best sentences in a novella full of great sentences. In miniature, it confidently defines the relation of Paul to the Finnish novella. It uses the anatomy of a river to depict the novella it appears within. In those four stages of the story, also the turns and drops in Paul's fast life, the final idea, the quietness, is the slowest and hardest to achieve. In 1973-74, when Norman was writing River, he wrote repeatedly about it to certain trusted friends. He said he was writing a story about his brother who was a great fly fisherman. He wanted it to be the best thing he's written, and, but he feared it would not be. Both the fear and the desire were absolutely true, and Norman's knowledge of his ability prevailed. He was exactly right about River. The eddy I've been tracing, to kind of wrap it up here, ends with a precise forecast of the story's remainder. It's harder, he states, to recognize the comic. For example, life, li when life lies ready to be taken as a joke, end quote. That wonderful low Shakespearean comedy, of, for example, of the immediately following scene, with old Rawhide and Neil in drunken post-coedal sleep in the river bar, bare-assed and sunburned badly. And you might remember that, uh, that uh, that's built on the pun of the, with Norman and Paul seeing the bear comes around the mountain and it goes from B-E-A-R to B-A-R-E. <laughs> but McLean reserves for its own paragraph, to finish my little explication, his one sentence closing to this extraordinary interlude, what I've fancifully been calling an eddy. Quote, for all of us though, it is much easier to read the waters of tragedy, end quote. That is to say, the doomed arc of his brother's life and the span of A River Runs Through It. And that brings me back to my topic, reading the waters, especially riverine waters. I don't know if that it's any easier for us to see or understand or accept the tragic. I do know that death's a bitch, as a lot of you do our ultimate and unfathomable mystery, and for most, our baseline fear. This pronouncement, Norman's, 
leads directly to another of Rivers' most remarkable paragraphs, which I will not quote. Only the first sentence is the one that ushers in the climax. A river, though, has so many things to say that it is hard to know what it says to each of us." End quote. And that ends with the horror of Paul's body dumped in an alley. That's an unbelievable paragraph in the space it traverses. So though we try our hardest to occasionally become one with the river, that is to make sense out of the unpredictable flow of our life and the lives of those we most know and love, our labors to construct order and purpose and understanding always fall short, always are imperfect. That is our work as writers or ultimately readers to accept the limits, sometimes harsh, of our understanding. Because after all, our rivers know more than we do. Thank you. Okay, Bill. I'm going to have a little bit of fun thinking about, is, is, is John McClain here? There, in the back. I really liked your book, and I'm going to, this will be an overview of Would you use the microphone when you say yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> talk in, talk in. Sorry. I liked your book. <laughs> and this is sort of a, a few broad strokes on some big canvases of uh, the McLean oeuvre, uh, including two generations. Can you, can you hear me? I can't tell if the mic's... Am I okay over here? No. 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 I have to be right here. Oh, boy. Um, let's begin with the final paragraph in A River Runs Through It, which you hear all the time. Um, and I want to quibble a bit with that paragraph, that wonderful paragraph, iconic, and compare it to Young Men in Fire and Fire on the Mountain and make a few comments about McLean's needs and psyche. So let's begin with this paragraph which I discussed with Norman uh, at the, when we met at the Who Owns the West conference in Missoula in, what, 1979? And um, if I don't put on my glasses, I won't find the page. Uh, and we were discussing the first chapter of John, which he's quoting. And he and I had uh, similar knowledge of it. Eventually, all things merge into one, and a river runs through it. The river was cut by the world's great flood and runs over rocks from the basement of time. On some of the rocks are timeless raindrops. Under the rocks are the words, I am haunted by waters. And he's referring, of course, to, and he knew this, to the first chapter of, of John, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, that's the marvelous King James translation of that passage. And as I happened to wind up shepherding Norman in the conference, and we sat at a table at the Edgewater watching an after, late afternoon hatch, and I was drinking wine, he was drinking whiskey, um, and we were commenting on all this, and I, I brought up that, that passage in John, and it turned out that both of us we're old, uh, he's older, but I'm now old too. And we both had Latin and Greek, and he had read John as I had in the New Testament Greek, which by the way is fairly easy and absolutely beautiful Greek. And then the King James translation is very good, but in the original, in the beginning was the word. The word in Greek there is logos. And logos in Greek meant 
meaningful order, the principle of meaningful order, the possibility of meaningful order, the primary example of which, to the Greeks, was human language. So logos really meant order, and then by extension uh, meant language, meaningful language. For instance, in um, Oedipus the King in Sophocles, Oedipus is depressed and excited. I don't know why. He just figured out that by mistake he had killed his father and married his mother. So <laughs> it was a bad day. And, and Creon, his best friend, is trying to get him to calm down, you know, like you do with a, a child, you know, say, so please, you know. And Creon says literally, if you will only use your logos with me, which could be translated as, if you will only speak in complete sentences, <laughs> if you will be reasonable and rational. So in, in John, which dominates the last couple of pages of, of A River Runs Through It, um, the idea is that the logos of the river and the logos of humans, that word which is meaningful order, the possibility of meaningful order is invoked to, to save John. Now, water in McLean, and in a river runs through it, as Alan was saying, the water and reading the river become sort of sacred ways of finding a meaning that might, and you know, we're just human here, that might redeem Paul's needless death. And of course, you can't do that, but you can try. Uh, and, but notice that the water McLean chooses all the time is the Blackfoot in its normal state. But if you're, I'm a canoeist, if you're a kayaker, a rafter, or a canoeist, you know that in flood stage, water is chaos. And Norman stays away from that. If you're on a river in flood, and I've had this happen, uh, in, in a section that looks calm for 100 yards, but very fast and brown and frightening, but a boil can come up and lift your boat three feet up, and you'll slither off to the side of that boil, and it'll disappear. It's unpredictable. So I'm going to look at the other side of Norman's wonderful invocation of the river, logos, and meaningful order. If he used water, as I say, in, not in flood stage, but if he used water uh, to represent that logos, harmony, and meaning, fire was chaos. And Young Men and Fire is a strange book and I had the opportunity to comment on it. I can't remember just when it came out in the 90s, but it had, was it in the, hmm? 1992. 92, oh, I was close. And either that year or the next year or the next year after. Um, the National Meeting of Fire Fighters and Strategists, uh, and of course the Fire Lab is here in Missoula that's a, a crucial part of that in the whole country, um, their annual meeting was here, and, and I was asked to speak on Young Men and Fire, just because I'd already published 10 Tough Trips and had done work on McLean. And I was one of the two or three warm-up acts in the afternoon for the keynote by Laird Robinson. So I had the opportunity to both discuss the word and logos with Norman McLean and to discuss my reading of Young Men and Fire with Laird Robinson. So that's, that was fun, okay? Young Men and Fire is a mess. And it's a mess because Norman is trying to confront tragedy <laughs> and does not want to admit that it's in the midst of chaos here and you can't get logos out of chaos but by god he kept trying over and over and over and the book is almost obsessive 
You go out to the field, you go back to the fire lab, you, he's wanting answers. And fire, which surrounds us, <laughs> doesn't it, is, as you know, f a real wildfire is like a river in flood. It is unpredictable. An ember can land 10 miles away, and the slight wind shift can make it come to life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But Norman was determined in order again to save some young men worth loving. <laughs> he was determined to find some order that could at least make him adjust to their death. And the book goes over and over, back and forth. I, I won't take the time to read you much of that or any of it because um, I'd rather save time for questions. But the publisher's note at the very beginning of Young Men and Fire says in the second paragraph, it was probably unfinished. And it sort of makes excuses for this accumulative structure of trying to understand, trying to understand, disappointment, disappointment. And that same kind of structure, though it's controlled, comes into John's Fire on the Mountain because there are no answers and I think in a job of excellent reporting in the last fourth or so of the book, John really fairly, without malice, shows how the bureaucracies of different types of offices involved in fighting the fire were competing as much as helping, were not sharing information, so it becomes a tragedy of the chaos of federal bureaucracies trying to fight fires, and that also is resulting in the needless loss of young men. So for the McLean family, if the Blackfoot has become our iconic image of meaningful <clears throat> unity and beauty, fire has become a, a recurrent theme of the, the tragedy of chaos about which we can do nothing. I really think that for Norman, that, that straining for a Logos was inextricably involved with his love of his brother, the loss of the brother, and the attempt to put that in a meaningful context. Um, and I wish that he could have found in fire and in discussing fire <laughs> some equivalent of that Logos, but he couldn't, and I think neither could John. I'm going to stop there because I want to just raise these issues and hope that there's time for questions, answers, and a theologian is following me, so um, I expect a learned disquisition on uh, the problems of my interpretation of John and of Norman MacLean. Thank you very much. You may have the podium. Um, well, thank you. It's um, a great uh, privilege to be here. Um, I'd have to say, uh, well, being described as a theologian, and I noted on the, um, the uh, program that was on the website that uh, I was listed as scholar, Timothy Schilling, I thought that was delightful, um, particularly because it reminded me of when I was, when I was studying Greek in, uh, in Leuven, Belgium, as a young theology student. And we had a, uh, a young, wise-ass professor who would walk in every morning and he'd take one look at us and he'd say, good morning, scholars. <laughs> <laughs> so I would think uh, if there's any category of scholar that I fall into, it's probably, probably that one. And if I have any actual real uh, legitimate reason for being here today. It's simply, I think, one that I share with you 
and that is that I, I love uh, Norman McLean. I love his work. It has been deeply meaningful to me in my life. And I think the only thing that has made me uh, in any sense um, uh, have some level of expertise on his work is simply that I just have immersed myself in it uh, because I enjoyed it so much and I got so much out of it. Um, so uh, I, I guess what I would like to share with you today are a couple things. Uh, the first is just how, how I came to love it. And the second is uh, a few things that I see in his work after having uh, stayed with it for so long. Um, I wanted to say something about how I came to love it because I think as this weekend of the festival shows, uh, a book has a life of its own once it gets out there and it comes to people in different ways and, and uh, it lives in different ways. And the first way it lived for me was actually on, uh, I'd be uh, perusing uh, bookstores in Seattle and this would be back in the, in the 1990s and it was uh, probably in the time I was still an undergraduate and um, come home for the summers from the East Coast and I'd see this this book on the shelf. And I'd always pull it off or, uh, I, um, and look at it. I loved the cover. That was the first thing I loved. I loved the cover. Somebody took this picture. Um, I think it's an old Forest Service photo. I'm not entirely sure given the information that's offered in the book. Um, but I loved that. And I loved the title. And I opened it up and I loved the, the first lines of it. And then I read a little further and I saw it was about fly fishing and I looked a few pages, pages further and I, and I saw there was more fly fishing in it and I thought, well, I'm not, I'm not so sure. So I didn't buy it at that time, but I would keep looking at it occasionally. My next encounter with Norman McLean was in uh, 1992, um, as Alan mentioned, I was getting ready to leave for uh, my theology studies. Originally, I went, I went to Europe because from, uh, from Seattle because I was studying to be a, a priest of the Catholic Archdiocese. And they sent me to the uh, American Seminary in Leuven, Belgium. But shortly before I left, I, uh, the New York Times in uh, the book review came out with a two-page spread. And I can remember uh, sitting there in the apartment that Sunday morning, opening it up and reading it and looking at those photos, which were from the book, and uh, being captivated by this account. And I thought, I have, to, I have to read that book. Shortly thereafter, I left uh, for, for my studies. And um, at, at some point, I ended up uh, buying a copy of um, Young Men in Fire. Um, and I think that was at a bookshop in Amsterdam. Um, and I read that book, and I read that first section, Black Ghost, and it, it got to me right away. And it had, it had to do with the fact that you could just feel that fire coming right, right behind, right up the hill. That it, was, it wasn't just that he could uh, re recreate, in the course of the book, the story of what happened to those smoke jumpers, it was that he also knew himself uh, exactly what it was like to fight a fire, so it opens with that section where he literally knows what it's, what it's like. And you know that this is his book that he dies trying to write. And he says in there, early on in, in that first section, he says, uh, uh, as he's running up the hillside, he says, uh, you know, how exhaustion overtakes him. And he, and, and he talks about uh, you die three times in a fire. And the first time is uh, in your legs. And the second time is in your lungs. And the third time is, is in prayer. And that so resonated with me and does to this day, I think, because as we all know, dying is not something which uh, comes at the end of life necessarily. Dying is something we experience every day. Um, we're aware of our own imminent death. We see people dying. Um, and in a, uh, for me, as a, as, a, as a Christian, 
dying stands central in the notion of coming to life. Uh, if we don't die to ourselves in some sense, we can't be reborn to something greater. Um, we can't live for something more if we're only living for ourselves. The next moment that uh, Norman McLean's uh, came to life for me was actually through the film, A River Runs Through It. Uh, I, I saw it eventually. I did not become uh, a priest. Um, I decided I eventually it would make more sense for me to be married. And while studying there, I did meet a young Dutch woman who now to this day is my wife. And uh, we saw that film together. And the film showed me, before I actually got to the book, that it was about something else. Uh, it was about something more than, than fly fishing. Um, as somebody pointed out last night at the, uh, at the barbecue, uh, I was talking to him, he said in passing, he was, a, he was himself a fisherman, comes here to fish, a Swedish fisherman, maybe, maybe you know him, maybe you've met him. Uh, but he said, it's about life. And that's it exactly, that's what that book is. It is indeed a, a manual of fly fishing, as uh, I think as Norman McLean intended for it to be, with, with being precisely accurate in its descriptions of the technique and what's involved. But it is also about so much more. And once I went to the book, reading it from uh, eventually from my front porch in Seattle and later to all of the other writings that Norman published, I came to get just much more of a sense of all that it really is about. And that's what I'd like to say something now about in, uh, in just the next few minutes. That is some of those other things that I think it's, it's about. I guess my thesis is that uh, if it's about fishing, uh, Norman McLean is uh, like Melville was in Moby Dick. He's after a big fish. And that big fish, I think, is the problem of life, or what uh, Alan Welsing uh, describes uh, so well, I think, is the problem of defeat, the tragic dimension of life. How do we come to terms with that? Um, Norman himself, uh, on the first page of River Runs Through It, points to this kind of, uh, um, Bill, I'll throw in another theological word, teleological uh, dimension of it, that the end of it what we're ultimately about, that that is what Norman McLean is interested in in this book. And he points that out when he says, he quotes the Westminster Shorter Catechism on the first page with the question, what is, uh, what is the chief end of man? Um, now quickly, the, uh, the catechism's own answer follows, and uh, I believe that was to, um, uh, to uh, enjoy God and, uh, or, glorify him forever. Um, and McLean calls that a beautiful answer. Um, but I think we all know, too, and we see in the, in the course of the book, that there's another way to answer that question. And you could say the answer to the question, what is the chief end of man? It's death. And then we're left with the question, is, is that it? I think this tension runs throughout all of all of Norman McLean's works, and I, and I think that uh, both of you have, have, have pointed to that thus far. Um, Norman's greatest works were tragedies, and uh, he taught Shakespeare's tragedies at the University of Chicago. Um, his earlier work on Custer was, was focused on a tragic story, um, River Runs Through It, uh, Young Men in Fire. And at the same time, he was raised um, in the church here next to us with uh, the gospel, which says that um, we die unto life and that Christ is the savior who died in order to save us. And the question I think that arose in his own heart over the course of his life is, uh, yeah, can we trust that, that promise or what, how do we make sense of this? His brother has died a tragic, you know, senseless death, so why, why would that happen? And how can that be part of God's plan? So that tension, I think, runs throughout the work. In trying to say something about it, um, we see all aspects of Norman's person come into play. He was uh, an excellent teacher at the University of Chicago, prize-winning teacher. 
He was also uh, well known as, uh, as a storyteller among his friends and became world famous as a storyteller through his books. And a poet, what, someone with truly a poet's heart. So he was applying all of these skills and at the same time drawing upon multiple discourses. If you look closely at uh, A River Runs Through It, you'll see that there are all sorts of knowledge feeding into this work. Uh, he, he employs geology, he calls upon biology, classical philosophy, Western history, various practical arts, literature and theology. They're all in there in this little, little, little manual on fishing. Um, you might think of them as tributaries, these sources of knowledge flowing into this, this river. And they all work imperceptibly together. Um, so we don't, we don't really notice it. Uh, and that's what makes the story a masterpiece, that he's working on so many levels at once doing this. To get a sense of how that, that works, I mean, you might think of Paul's uh, shadow casting. Um, and the, Norman McLean talks about it in there about um, superimposed rhythms. Um, in, this, in this case, I'll quote from, uh, from A River Runs Through It. He says, uh, with, with the shadow casting, it was, it was one rhythm superimposed upon another. Our father's four count rhythm of the line and wrist being still the bass rhythm, but superimposed upon it was the piston count of his arm and the long overriding four count of the completed figure eight of the reverse loop. The point of this, I think, is to, this is, gives a good image of the, the technique being applied. It's the same as in when Norman McLean talks about in uh, The Woods, The Books, and the Truant Officers of how various rhythms work together in poetry, that you can look at quantitative and qualitative, accentual and intonational and superimposed rhythms. Um, maybe just to give a more prosaic example of how we live, we all live our lives in various rhythms at once, there's the rhythm of a day that we live in, but there's also the rhythm of a season. There's the rhythm of our, of our work day, there's the rhythm of leisure, the rhythm of our own hearts beating. All of these things work together to make us the people we are. And uh, we're not necessarily aware of it, but they all contribute to make who we are. The final concern here is with the human person. And so I think what the book ultimately offers is, besides being a manual on fly fishing, it's also a manual on the art of living. Um, this notion of art appears early on and often in the book. Um, fly fishing is called our father's art, and Paul is described as a major artist. Uh, and we all, I think, will recall from the book the uh, immortal line um, that to our father, all good things, trout as well as eternal salvation, come by grace, and grace comes by art, and art does not come easy. So there's this notion of art uh, being of service to the human person. And in McLean's work, what you see is there is often a connection between the heart, the head, and the hands. That uh, a true artist will have all three. That art is really draws upon um, not only what we can do, but also uh, the notion of uh, living truly and living well, uh, doing something that is good. In his 1987 talk at, uh, over in Lewiston, uh, Idaho, uh, Norman McLean observed, what seems most beautiful to me and all I see about me is what men and women can create with their hands issuing from their hearts and heads. I think it's important to keep this idea of the human person in wholeness together, that art, whatever art we might offer to help us deal with our human condition, that it has to include the whole person. Um, in trying to be helpful, um, McLean offers some um, instruction or buried uh, suggestions. I think the first of these is that uh, he challenges us to pick up God's rhythms or to live 
our lives in accord with something, with the rhythm of something greater than ourself. A second point is that we, in doing this, do not have to create the wheel ourselves. There is a, if you will, a received wisdom that we can draw on. There is a knowledge that human people have, whether that's from philosophy or theology, and that we can learn this through a process of discipline. Um, this word uh, it uses the word uh, disciples on the or right at the start of a river runs through it. Um, I think that's a crucial notion. If you think in the recall in the film how uh, Norman learns to write as taught by his father, it is a question of kind of external discipline imposed. You you have to do this. These are the rules you practice until it gets to the point where that external discipline becomes self-discipline that one can apply oneself in living one's own life. It's the same with the way that they learn to cast. What you see in the course of the novel or the novella is a Paul breaking free of that um, in what I think is a passage that you could compare to when Paul, St. Paul, in Romans speaks of uh, a crossing over from rigorous adherence to the law to the newfound spiritual way. The final um, helpful thought that I find in, uh, in McLean's work that I want to share with you is a notion of the good, the true, and the beautiful, which I think is also contained in the book. Now, um, in, in classical philosophy and Christian theology, the good, the true, and the beautiful are known as the transcendentals. They are properties of being. And you might think of it uh, in terms of, uh, in one of his, his essays, um, Norman MacLean uh, quotes Hamlet, uh, from Hamlet. And uh, the most famous line, of course, from Hamlet is, to be or not to be. That is the question. Um, being, uh, in that sense of Hamlet, is not just a matter of am I going to live or die. It's the question of what is the quality of my life, and am I really going to be alive? Am I fully going to be alive? In, in the Christian gospel, it would be Christ saying, I have come that you should have life and have it to the full. So the question is, then, how do we do that? How do we live a life that is full? You might think of the transcendentals as uh, guiding lights on the way to this fullness of life. Um, Alan was just talking about trans transcendentalism. How do we transcend ourself? In A River Runs Through It, we, we see this happen, for example, with, with Paul, with his art. Um, he, learns, he learns from the wisdom, and then he pulls something out of himself that lifts himself, he taps into something that is greater than himself and he rises above himself. Um, that's why, that's what makes him beautiful. He has this vitality. He is, he is, he's beautiful. And he is, his, his art is revealing. He shows us a new way. Another way to live more fully is by way of goodness, by, by moral goodness. Um, we see that in the, in the book, for example, in the effort of the family to try to help Paul. Um, and then there's the matter of truth. In all of his writing, uh, and very strongly in his effort to tell the story of his brother and their family's tragedy truly in uh, River Runs Through It, and to get the story right, in Young Men and Fire, Norman McLean is concerned with the truth. Um, all of these things, I think, work together and are consciously, I, I think, in some way intentionally tapped into by Norman McLean in the writing of this. I don't, I, don't, I don't think these notions are there by accident, in particular because the words good, true, and beautiful appear uh, near the beginning of the work in an interesting way, and they 
they reappear at the end of the work in a pronounced fashion in, in uh, several of the passages. Um, just to give an example of that, it's in the exchange between uh, Norman and his father where he asks him, you like to tell true stories, don't you? In, in the Bible, uh, the, the Holy Spirit is associated with, with truth. Um, and then we have the scene where uh, Norman comes upon his father with the book, and it's described as the good book. In 1978, at a talk at the University of Chicago in Montana State, Norman McLean asked rhetorically, but I think tellingly, what would be wrong? He was looking back at having written uh, this successful novel. He said, what would be wrong with hoping to make something beautiful, true, and good? So I think he was, he was doing something with this notion there. And I think it's not, uh, it's not a hard and fast thing. I don't think that this is a, uh, a, a kind of an allegory where you can pin it down very tightly. But I think, I think it's there. And I think that that suggestion of the Holy Trinity is there. In Christian theology and St. Thomas Aquinas, you can make a tie between the transcendentals, the good, the true, and the beautiful, and God, who is good, true, and beautiful. And even with the Holy Trinity, where each person of the Trinity can be associated with goodness, truth, and beauty. Even recently, even my, uh, my own Pope Francis has called upon, uh, drawn upon this very recently in uh, a couple of his encyclicals, uh, speaking of Christ's, Christ's beauty. And in the Bible, as I just said, the Holy Spirit is the helper and the spirit of truth. Um, you could, if you wanted to take the step, and this is and now I'm about at the end of my, because <laughs> I'm going to fall off the cliff. <laughs> you could even see some sort of connection in A River Runs Through It between the Trinity and this Trinity of people we see before us. The Good Father, the, uh, the Beautiful Son, the, uh, the One who is a helper, um, the spirit of truth, trying to get at the truth. These are just, these are just suggestions. Um, but I think they come back indeed in that image of perichoresis and a very, very moment, the, the creation account that's in the book as well, the collaborative work that is done between uh, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit at creation. I, I, yesterday I got to look at the McLean family cabin and um, that comes into play here in the whole notion of building and the, the water and the rock and the mud. Um, I think it's about, the book is really about, ultimately about everything. Um, and that's what makes it so fantastic. Thanks. sitting for quite a while, but uh, before you stir yourselves too far for by way of break or anything else, what questions or comments would you like to raise? About Norman or anything that's been said in the last uh, hour or so. I have a question and response. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. I, oh, how's that? You're sitting on my cord. <laughs> Alan, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed that. Um, <laughs> as Tim was talking, in a way, the three of us have said, um, have touched on something that hasn't quite been brought to the surface, and that is, Look, that last paragraph of A River Runs Through It is gorgeous. And that gorgeousness and the beautiful river, uh, all of that has to be balanced a little bit against the other side. We're, we're, we're all here about good feelings and beauty. Um, and the tragedy 
gets lost, and it's only in the face of tragedy that <laughs> most religions and <laughs> anything else true gets said. The end, I won't read that last paragraph again, you've heard it three times, but at the end he says, I am haunted by waters. And I just want to come back to that tragic note, I am haunted by waters, that's always struck me. I mean, he's just said, and some of the words are the, under the rocks of the words, and some of the words, John, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, are theirs. And, and, and this whole conference centers, for good reason, on the beauty of the Blackfoot, and the saving of the Blackfoot, and good works. But I've always kind of hung up on why haunted by waters. He's, the waters have been the salvation. The waters have been a positive instrument. Frank Kermode, a great British critic, once said that all ghost stories are about how the past haunts the present. And the last word, <laughs> I am haunted by waters, reminds you that the needless, stupid, death, waste of life of a beloved brother <laughs> was at the center of the story. And in a way, everything I was saying about fire <laughs> is suggested by haunted, that there, it, it's not a complacent end. It is a beauty snatched from the jaws of defeat. <laughs> it is an affirmation of life and the river that includes a realistic awareness of how the past including all the tragedies you know, want to name, how, how the past and tragedy haunts the present in the midst of that beauty. And now I'm going to hand the mic to Alan. <laughs> Let's see if I can sit on it. Um, uh, but the, but the, uh, the response and what's perhaps the most moving what, feature in both books is the, is the reminder, the, the constant reminder that we are first and last storytelling creatures. Narration is, is uh, genetically wired into us, the disposition towards a story. And so the struggle against chaos is the, is the uh, uh, Sisyphean effort to create story out of catastrophe. I've said many times in the past that uh, if you think that if uh, Norman's haunted by waters, why would you read uh, how he's haunted by fire, which is a silly thing to say, so because it's so uh, acutely obvious. And and you know, in Yellman and Fire, he uh, as he obsessively returns, the returning sort of takes different forms. It, it kind of represents, as I've said in the past, different what modes of knowledge, modes of knowledge. And in the the uh, part two of Yellman and Fire, it's mostly uh, it's this sort of pragmatic and deductive uh, way of knowing. Uh, what exactly happened and why, but that's insufficient. And in some respects, the the most curious and moving and uh, maybe even astonishing part is the very brief part three, where he spiritually or even mystically tries to come to terms with the death of 13, which as you remember at the very end, he ties right back to the death of his own wife, which has occurred years earlier. So I'm just trying to say, Absolutely. Sure, there's that chaos, and if we are rivers, we exist in flood stage. And uh, Bill's comments remind me so much of, uh, uh, and Tim referring to black ghosts at the beginning of Young Men and Fire. Fire is nightmare. It's the stuff of nightmare. I don't know if you remember in the other novella, but there's a remarkable passage where, where Mac or Norman, the youngest on the Forest Service crew, is remembering his own firefighting days. And he talks about mountains moving. And that's not uh, settling or settled at all. That's, uh, that's closer to the stuff of nightmare. So there's that, there's the, <clears throat> there's the world out there, and then there are these desperate and poignant and eloquent uh, efforts towards imposing story. On what on the on the chaos that's our lives, or our only siblings' brutal murder when he was in his mid thirties, or um, these deaths long ago now in Man Gulch, uh, whatever form you want, uh, it's sort of that, uh, and 
the, the storytelling impulse also is tied up with all those aesthetic and and uh, and, uh, and Christian efforts towards imposing order. And there's some wonderful, wonderful McLeanian sentences that show the order, show him trying. If if we are first and last linguistic creatures, if that's how we create order and purpose in and of and from our own lives, he's he's modeling that repeatedly. But here here are these talking heads talking too much again. Please. As a Shakespearean scholar, most of his academic career, and now that we've had these works for a long time, have people looked at any of the like allusion to tragedies, sort of a Shakespearean analysis of any of his works? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, there was a big book of uh, boring, what's called literary criticism, that came out in 1952. Uh, and Norman MacLean had two essays on it. And uh, to this day, I've never made it through the second essay, which is on the aesthetics uh, properties of uh, 18th century British lyrical poetry. Uh, he's being a lot more generous about that period of uh, poetry in British literary history than I am. But the important, the, the, for me, the really important uh, uh, essay is the other one. Uh, and if you are pretty interested in, as I gather all you are in Norman MacLean, you really need to look up and find his essay. I think it's online. It's called Episode, S Speech, Scene, Episode, Scene, Speech, Word, colon, The Madness of Lear. So he's writing about King Lear. And he's writing about King Lear and claiming that Shakespeare is trying something that Shakespeare's never tried before in the middle of that, uh, what, what a lot of Shakespearean scholars call blackest of, of, of the tragedies, when the old king goes crazy, basically. So you have internal chaos that's externalized by the beginning of Act Three, And in this essay, Norman is talking about how Shakespeare is trying on something he's never tried before. And that becomes, I've, I've said many times in the past, that is his own poetics. That becomes um, Norman's aesthetic blueprint, really. He uses, that's much more interesting for McLean than for, for King Lear. Um, we've been talking a lot today about, the, or, or you all have, about um, order and chaos and, and grace and beauty. And so much of that is, obviously focused right around the river itself. Do you find other incidents in, of grace and beauty and order in McLean's work that occur off the river? Can you repeat the question? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are there, what, instances, versions of, expressions of uh, order, grace, beauty uh, that occur away from the river? which in River is the symbolic center of the family. That's the question that Peter Stark is asking. <laughs> yes and no, I think, Peter. Um, with that circular, repetitious structure in Young Men in Fire, um, there is the beauty of trying for answers with the repeated experience of having no answers, getting no answers. He can't finally explain why. Um, but I do think that's why haunted is wonderful. There's aesthetic <laughs> perfection, harmony, uh, I think, in being exact about the relation of tragedy and comedy and and of course, King Lear, the King Lear is the same, it's the death of his child that, that is driving the end of that play. Um, why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life? And thou no breath at all. I'll, I'll turn this over to the theologian. <laughs> but I do think as I think all of us have been saying something similar, which, which is that dark note in McLean, his honesty about the needless deaths going on that he's writing about in all of his work. 
um, that honesty is like a redemption <laughs> and uh, to us aesthetically I hand it to a higher power than mine um, just a, a scene that comes to mind um, from the book is the, the dancing scene with Monacita um, and there uh, Norman talks about when you know she's dancing with Paul and, and then when he, he gets a chance to dance with her and he says, you know, it's um, dancing, it, it, was so, it was so graceful and feeling like just being lifted off of the earth. So that kind of that idea of transcendence comes in there. Um, and then you, you see that kind of recapitulated later in the jail scene where they're, they're lying there on the floor. And this is, this is sort of the opposite. Then her legs are like dead things. And he has another scene where he talks about a, a, a fishing rod being like a, a stick without brains. I think it's a similar kind of dynamic, the loss of that. And, uh, and Paul in that same scene is yeah. covering his eyes to keep out the light. So with his, with his right hand, so with his casting hand. So what is for him kind of the source of grace, where we see him otherwise, now they're both kind of broken and we get what life can also be. And, and also, that's the line, I forget, is it, and grace comes by art, or is it art comes by grace? And grace comes by art, but art does not come easy. Uh, is that right? Yeah. And in a way, we're all three saying that to you, that the aesthetic uh, of striving <laughs> is, is pretty yeah, constant like in the work. Yeah. And, and, and with a very Scots, that Scotch dryness, which I just love. And actually, John might be able to answer this. I, thinking about McLean, and thinking, for some reason I thought of the, I was thinking of the New England Presbyterian dryness, a lot of which came from Scotland and some from Catholic Ireland. Uh, and of, Did any of the McLeans, McLean's father must have been fairly contemporary with Robert Frost, who I think 1912 was a boy's will. I'll bet his father loved Frost. Um, what's a, what's a, a dry Frost poem? Um, some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But I think I know enough of hate to say that it is also great and would suffice. <laughs> now, I think the McLean family would have loved that kind of dry New England Presbyterian ironic wit. Do, do you have any idea if they were familiar with Frost's work? Um, I'd have to the first one. Yeah, I'm I might voice Please. Someone, now this is a shock, someone with knowledge will take the mic. <laughs> well, it's nice to have a bunch of you guys to, to explain what our lives are all about. <laughs> um, it was a living. Yeah, yeah. Alan's been doing that for a long time for me. Uh, he actually took a course from uh, for us, a seminar at Dartmouth University. And uh, he re described it dryly. He said that the students would gather, you know, with the piano and the book line thing and whatnot. And at the moment that the seminar began, Frost would open the door and walk in. And as he walked in, he would start talking. And the clock would tick through whatever it was, 45 minutes or 50. And as the clock hit its last second, he would close the door behind him. He had no interest and what the students had to say. Uh, but he was Robert Frost, and dry, and New England, and uh, that's the answer. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, maybe one more question? Is that all right? Yes, please. Um, I'm curious. What an amazing man. If you walked up to him on the street, would you say, hello, I'm Maybe that's not a fair question to ask, but he sounds like an absolute <coughs> wealth 
of wisdom and knowledge. He's here in Missoula, Montana, for crying out loud. I mean, you wouldn't think you'd find that. firefighters and the branch of philosophers and teachers. If we went into him in downtown Missoula, what would we see? Like, you, you look a lot like your dad, I think, in the pictures. But what would we see as a person? John, would you like to speak to that? If you could tell me, I couldn't hear it. We can't hear the questions. Well, Norman McLean sounds too, too good to be true. What would he be like um, if we were, ran into him down on uh, out here on Front Street on the other side of the Higgins Bridge or something like that? And uh, what kind of conversation might we have? Would he be? How would he relate to uh, farmers or uh, firefighters, bloggers, cowboys, professors? <laughs> <laughs> he knew that one. Well, I'm a narrator and a storyteller. I used to come down to Missoula with my dad when I was just a little kid. Uh, and uh, he was in his 50s um, from the cabin. You know, we'd come out uh, every year and spend the whole summer out here. And he still had a lot of contacts uh, in Missoula. And he had a list uh, with him of names of his father's parishioners. And uh, we would go and visit them, and they were all women, I noted. Um, <laughs> the men had all died. Uh, and as the years went by, um, I got less in the way of tea and cakes because the women are not as capable, and the list got shorter. And it finally disappeared altogether. But as we walked around town, uh, uh, we would see a lot of people that he knew, uh, that he had gone to school with, and who knew him. And he had obviously transcended, and everybody knew it. Uh, and he was treated as someone who was uh, not just the preacher's kid, which puts you in a special class to begin with, but someone who had gone away and done well. Uh, he was a professor at the University of Chicago. And it could be kind of disheartening, I remember, um, and almost pathetic, uh, and I mean that in the literary sense rather than the insulting sense. I remember one time we were just walking down the street uh, in downtown Missoula, and a guy jumped out of a Jay's Potato Chips van and came over and accosted my dad. He was a high school friend of his and was obviously very pleased to see dad, uh, ran back to his potato chip van and got a couple of sacks of potato chips and gave them to us. And that you know, polite, which was not always the case with him. Uh, and the guy drove off and he looked at me and said, see, that's what I left. <laughs> there are a lot of things about Montana he didn't like. He didn't like the fact that the uh, Helena Independent Record, when my Uncle Paul was killed, ran a photograph of Paul McLean. That was a photograph of Norman McLean. His own newspaper, that's Paul's newspaper. He didn't like the fact that he came back from Dartmouth after having taught there for two years as a teaching assistant at the college level uh, and could not obtain a teaching certificate for high school to teach high school in Missoula. And it made him so mad that he uh, applied to the University of Chicago and left. So he had, it wasn't, you know, all lovey-dovey stuff. Uh, and I think that that's important to remember about him. He could be very rude uh, to people. Uh, and nothing springs to mind, and if it did, I probably wouldn't go into it. But I think anybody who knew him, Bill, you know, knew that he had a real rough side. Uh, and part of that was uh, a sense of dissatisfaction uh, 
with some of the things out here. We all know how he loved it, which is important to remember that he left. Uh, he wanted to be here. If we tried, we would have taught in high school. I thought of joining the Forest Service uh, and didn't choose those ways. But he did end up writing, as you all know, and it should, this Norman McLean sentence has been said out loud uh, yet, so I'm going to steal it. The world is full of bastards, which increase in direct proportion the farther one gets from Missoula, Montana. So thank you very much for sitting all this time. I hope you can get back there and get something to get to the drink. Good morning. I guess it's still morning. So it is uh, my great pleasure again today. Some of you, few of you here yesterday, some of you weren't. But I am Lori Messenger. I'm the English and Creative Writing teacher at Sealy Swan High School. And it is my um, great pleasure to introduce to you some Sealy students who are going to read their poems published in Backroads, which are available for sale on the back table. And this is the second year Backroads of the Mind, which is a student publication that's completely edited and put together. And the poems in it and the visual art in it are done by students at Sealy Swan. Last year, we made our focus um, kind of rivers and journeys, rivers, the literal river, river as a metaphor as well. And um, one of the things that I love about teaching at Sealy, and um, the reason I keep making that drive back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, because I actually live in Missoula, is that I have a group of 108 students who have really, really different political views, come from families with very, very different political views, and yet can completely agree on absolutely loving and being a part of this place that we live. And when it comes to creating art to express that, um, they are spot on and such a pleasure to work with. So um, this is a, a very new experience for some of these folks who are gonna read to you today. And um, we're so happy that they came. So uh, first of all, which of you is going to actually read first? OK. So the first person who's coming up is actually not a student. And um, I'll let her tell you um, her relationship to this place. But she's going to read a student poem. Hi, everybody. Some of you know me. Some of you don't. I'm Vicki. I uh, have lived in Sealy Lake for 25 years pretty attached to the place. I'm going to cry. <laughs> and pretty attached to these kids. And um, Tara has given me the honor of reading her poem. And Tara has the honor of living at the lodges on Sealy Lake. Her parents own that resort, which is just a few steps down the beach from where Norman McLean had his cabin. So here's a vision of an evening on the dock of the next generation of people lucky enough to live on that lake. <laughs> Sorry, Tara. <laughs> Out where the wood is rough and splintery, we hauled pillows and sleeping bags. The campfire was illuminating the trees, and sparks were flying. It took ages to get everything right. We were cozy in our sleeping bags and wrapped in fuzzy blankets. And then it hit. The rain started coming in bucket loads, soaking our blankets all the way through. We weren't going to let a little rain stop us. After sitting on that dock so many times, I thought I had seen it all. That morning was something new. It was a completely different world. We awoke to the birds chirping away. The sun was bright, but there was still a chill in the air. So there we were, lying on the dock with the fog rising all around us. Tara Birch. Um, I'm Kara Good, and this is my ode to the stars. The way you shine all year round, despite the clouds, the cities, even the sun, always there like a baby bird to its nest, never leaving. The feeling of overwhelming insignificance you inflict upon me, like an ant gazing up at the giant forest of trees. Your never-ending mystery causes my head to ache as I attempt to scale you down to size. Nevertheless, the way, way deep down inside, 
you somehow reassure me that I am connected to the infinite galaxies and in space that are much larger than myself, like a spider intertwined in its web. So uh, my name is Elizabeth. I was here yesterday, and because I wrote my I wrote. I read my piece out of the book yesterday. I'm actually going to read a piece that I haven't published yet. And um, this is a piece that I actually did for my English final last year. <laughs> Fluidly spoken. Once the sky fell to its knees, seemingly bound to the ground by trees or its own weight, where it fell between myself and Hill 16, the river gladly received it, throwing a veil of mist upward. It was then I wondered what language the river and the sky speak. For two weeks, words pounded the cracked yellowing ground, fostering a growth among wilting grass and wildflowers. They smelt of wild mint from my porch. Sheets of stratus rested low, a valley lid keeping the peaks from view. Once the river spoke to the sky in a language I could not understand, where the words were not sharp, not demeaning, not selfish. I doubt I'll see it in my lifetime. Maybe one day humans too will learn to speak fluidly. Um, since I was chief editor and also filled the role of graphic designer for this year's edition of Backroads of the Mind, um, I want to give you a little bit of background on just how we put this book together. It is completely 100% done by students. What we do is our class makes a, a list of submission guidelines and we send those out school-wide and anyone in the high school can submit and there's different guidelines for different pieces of work. So um, then we take those submissions that we get in and um, this year our process was quite lengthy because our submission due dates were lengthened and lengthened. <laughs> but uh, we go through them as a class and we select pieces that we think have really good potential and, and or fit our theme. And then we take those pieces and then they go to our graphic designer who also happened to be me this year. And they start going into a template of the book which is all done on the computer. And then basically it goes back to the class for review so they can decide if we want to move a piece of uh, like a poem next to a certain picture or maybe we want a certain piece to uh, break up two other pieces that we have. And there's quite a lot of thought and a lot of depth that goes into um, just the order that we put um, the book in. It's, it's very well crafted the way that we put um, certain pieces next to each other. So I had the pleasure of getting the pretty much fullest extent of all of that. And um, this year I will be training um, one of our kids that read yesterday, Kyle Pelty. He will learn the graphic designing side of it this year. So hopefully I won't have to do it all. <laughs> um, but every piece in here is um, something that a student felt the desire and the motivation to produce. So it's very, um, for me, knowing how the creative writing class began, I had a big hand in that as well. It's interesting to see just the wide range of work that we've gotten and how some of these kids who have submitted over the past two years have developed as artists and writers. And it's very interesting. And this year we will be making a third volume and I can't wait to see how that comes out as well. Well, I understand so well how Vicky felt when she was reading that poem because <laughs> it happened to me. These kids are just amazing. I, um, I'm in awe. When I was their age, I could barely read, I think. <laughs> well, um, now it's my great pleasure um, and duty to introduce 
David Brooks, our next speaker. David uh, joined the Montana chapter of Trout Unlimited in March of 2016 when he was appointed um, the Director of Conservation where he was responsible for overseeing the state fisheries and the Aquatic Invasive Species Protection Program, really important in our state. And after that year of doing that job, he became Executive Director in 2017. Uh, prior to working at Trout Unlimited, he researched Superfund sites. And that came about as he studied for his PhD from the University of Montana, uh, as he worked on his thesis on the Superfund cleanup and removal of the Milltown Dam, which became the foundation for his marvelous book, Restoring the Shining Waters. So please welcome David Brooks. Thanks to the young poets there, that was bold and beautiful and intimidating to follow. Nice job. Um, so I think probably most of us, I can assume, in this room are familiar with the high-jumping, hard-fighting trout of the Blackfoot River that enlivened lots of the scenes in Norman McLean's A River Runs Through It. Um, probably within 10 years of the publication of that book, certainly early 1980s, even the novella's hero, Paul, would have been hard-pressed to catch any such fish in the river. By that time, a history of mining in the headwaters, logging on the hillsides of the Blackfoot Valley, roads, uh, grazing, overfishing had destroyed the fishery to the point that our state fish, wildlife, and parks agency was no longer even surveying the river for fish. Why bother? The legacy there um, had led to the fishery becoming known for small, anemic, um, wild but not native rainbow trout mostly. And yet, today, people come from all over the world to fish the Blackfoot. On a fairly decent day, you could expect to catch both healthy, large, wild rainbow trout a couple of weeks ago, I saw a young woman catch a two-foot-long brown trout um, just as she rolled by my boat, and I was having a crappy day, but good for her. <laughs> People catch native whitefish, uh, cutthroat trout, and even though they're not fishing intentionally for them, the threatened bull trout. As a historian, when you see change like that, you have to kind of ask the big, most important question that historians ask, which is, so what? Like, great for the Blackfoot, but what does that mean in the bigger picture? What does that mean in the world, and how is that important? I think the reason it's important is because the Blackfoot, in recovering its fishery, has become the model for recovering riparian areas, aquatic environments and whole watersheds in Montana, in the West, and I would argue in the nation. Maybe Stefan, after I get done, can talk about how that is true around the world as well, that the Blackfoot is a model and an inspiration. How many folks got to hear Ryan Nidecker talk yesterday about restoration of the Blackfoot? Great, so a lot of you are familiar with lots of the really good stories and the work that she has been integral to. Um, let me give you a quick 30,000 foot overview of some of that. In 1980 or early 80s, Trout Unlimited gave some seed money to the Fish, Wildlife and Parks, our state managing agency, to actually start counting fish again and to try to identify what the big problems were in the Blackfoot. Among other things, some of the top priorities were management. Literally, people had been harvesting fish too much. You'll remember in A River Runs Through It, every fish the brothers and father caught 
went into a creel and ostensibly went home to be cooked for dinner. That was the tradition of fishing. FWP uh, decided to institute catch and release on the Blackfoot in the 80s. And it's not that that was a brand new management technique, but it certainly emanated out of the Blackfoot through the rest of the state's fisheries management. And now you can hardly get anyone to keep a trout in this state. Even in places like the Beaverhead, where there are just too many brown trout, you cannot get people from Dillon to bring home brown trout because this ethic has emanated out of the Blackfoot and influenced the rest of our fishery and fisheries management. And for good reason. I'm not saying that it's catch and release is bad, but that's how pervasive it is, and that's the effect the Blackfoot has had. Um, FWP also was working in the Blackfoot with the uh, Fish Wildlife Service, the federal agents, um, on management of resources. But at the time, fish wildlife agents in the Blackfoot were mostly waterfowl biologists. They were duck guys, not fish guys. And what happened in the Blackfoot was that local people, landowners who cared about the river and the environment, got together with fisheries management managers from FWP and service officials and started talking about how to work together. And rather than the um, service folks just concentrating on preserving species at national wildlife refuges, just on federal land, thinking about the whole watershed and how to recover the entire watershed. Over the years, some of the stats and what they've achieved are that more than 30 tributaries that at one point no longer even connected to the main stem river have been reconnected. Um, countless dozens more have um, increased fish, fish passage where culverts and roads had blocked fish, fish passage. Those have been improved and open up to spawning fish. Hundreds of miles of stream have been restored, planting willows, creating meanders where straight lines had been carved into streams. And of course, one of the most important things in the Blackfoot more than 200 landowners have participated in more than 500 restoration efforts. And so it's been a whole watershed community effort that has included local people, state and federal agents, and NGOs, conservation organizations like mine, Montana Trout Unlimited, our chapter there, the Blackfoot Challenge. Um, last night we heard of all the great work of the Nature Conservancy. And at the heart of that was really local people particularly the people who started the Blackfoot Challenge and the big Blackfoot chapter of Trout Unlimited. People like Ryan Nidecker, people like Lan Lindbergh, and Hank Getz, who we got to hear last night over dinner. The thing about the Blackfoot, though, is that it hasn't just been about making the Blackfoot better. That restoration work has, as I said, been the model elsewhere. And let me start with a story I know really well, which is the Milltown Dam. Up until a few years ago, the Milltown Dam was in the Clark Fork River, about seven miles northeast of here. Um, and it blocked and <coughs> flooded under the reservoir the confluence of the Blackfoot and the Clark Fork. It had been there for nearly 100 years. As the name implies, the Milltown Dam provided power for the local sawmills that processed lumber that came out of the Blackfoot and then went up to uphold the adits and mines of Butte, as well as at one point fire the smelters that processed the ore that came out of those mines. And in return, waste rock and pollution flowed downstream in the Clark Fork, piled up behind the Milltown Dam, and by 1980 became the cause of the Milltown Dam being listed as one of the first Superfund sites in the country. Up until the late 90s, the remedy at Superfund, or Milltown Superfund site, was all about getting rid of that pollution, making sure the dam was stable and safe. But in 1998, Bruce Babbitt, who was the Secretary of the Interior, shows up in Montana goes to the Blackfoot, sort of symbolically is casting a dry fly on the Blackfoot in June 
when nothing is hatching, no fish are eating off the top, he would have been better with a nymph or a streamer or something. But he wasn't there to catch fish. It was symbolic fishing. He was there to catch the attention of the media because he was announcing that bull trout were being listed as an endangered species under the Endangered Species Act. Let me read to you what he had to say that day about sort of the hope of doing that and why he came to the Blackfoot. And usually, you know, nominating a species that may wink out an extinction is not a hopeful thing. But here's what Babbitt had to say that day. The reason I came out here today to make this announcement is because I wanted to find the place, the one place in the West that I thought told the most powerful story about the possibility for restoration. That was the Blackfoot. As attention moved to restoring native fish on the Blackfoot, it changed the conversation of what to do with the Milltown Dam and how to recover the largest Superfund site in the country, the Clark Fork River. Essentially, a fisheries biologist from Missoula or from this region started asking about ways to recover bull trout. One of the things he landed on was, is this dam blocking fish migration? Do fish want to get above this dam and spawn in the rivers and tributaries above there? And the common wisdom at the time was that, no way. That dam's been there for 100 years. Fish don't have evolutionary memory. They don't know that many generations before they spawned in tributaries of the Blackfoot. Well, he went and checked it out. And sure enough, at spawning times of the year, there were hundreds of thousands of native fish piling up at the base of the Milltown Dam, smashing themselves into the dam, trying to get up above it. So David Schmetterling caught a bunch of these fish, put radio tags in them, put them in coolers, drove them above the reservoir, let them go and tracked where they went. And as you might expect, most of them went up the Blackfoot and went into tributaries of the Blackfoot, many of which had recently been reconnected by the Blackfoot Challenge, Blackfoot Chapter of Trout Unlimited, federal and state agencies. It changed the conversation about the Milltown Dam. Health of the Blackfoot, restoration of the Blackfoot, changed the conversation from leaving the dam in place, getting rid of toxins, to we gotta take this thing down, which is of course what eventually happened and became the first, and as far as I know, the only dam removal that has happened under Superfund. It's been held up as sort of a, if not the example of us being in a new era of dam removal and restoration in this country. Something else was happening at the same time or pre slightly previous to that with the Fish Wildlife Service. As I said, you know, it was mostly duck biologists up there for a long time. But as these folks got turned on to the idea of working with partners like individual landowners, like the state, and thinking beyond just preservation on federal lands, the Blackfoot became the model, the textbook, of how to do restoration for the Fish Wildlife Service. That model flowed up to the regional office in Denver, flowed to the national office. Fish Wildlife Service people started coming to the Blackfoot to observe what had happened. It became a classroom. Ambassadors from the Blackfoot went out to other parts of the country to sort of spread the lesson and the model or at least ideas from it elsewhere. Today in my work at Montana Trout Unlimited, I see hundreds of watershed organizations, chapters of TU that model themselves on the Blackfoot. Um, for example, Arctic grayling recovery in our own Big Hole Valley has been modeled on the Blackfoot. Some of the more interesting ones when I was looking into this, this model has gone even beyond just trout streams, cold water, and traditional fisheries that, like we think of in this state. Um, Kansas tallgrass prairie restoration has been modeled on the Blackfoot. Sand Hill areas of um, Sand Hill restoration in Nebraska has been modeled on the Blackfoot. Both of those paying attention to pothole wetlands, prairie streams. Even a lot of the restoration work that has happened in the Everglades in Florida has been based on some key lessons from the Blackfoot, such as thinking of whole watersheds rather than individual projects. 
um, using fisheries science to guide all of restoration. What's good for the fish, what's good for the bull trout is going to be good for the hillsides, for streamside vegetation, for everything, for bugs, for birds. Um, it's kind of the iconic species that you, that you mitigate for and you get all these other benefits. I see this in the news all the time. Every year, the Washington Post, the New York Times, I believe you mentioned reading an article about Norman McLean's book in the Blackfoot in the New York Times. It's yearly in the New York Times, in Outside Magazine, Field and Stream, The Drake, state newspapers, local newspapers, year in and year out, retell the story of the Blackfoot. They reference Norman's River, the book, the movie, the restoration in the Blackfoot, and what a success story it is, and how it's been a model. Just a couple years ago, I remember seeing that the White House released a report called America's Great Outdoors, Promise to a Future Generation. This was supposed to be the blueprint of how to get young people involved in outdoor recreation that wasn't competitive sports, and more importantly, conservation work. When it came to watershed health, watershed activities, and rivers, it was the Blackfoot that was featured, not surprisingly to me, because of all the good work that has happened there. More recently, this summer, I was involved in getting a, a news story out about how um, the Blackfoot is an example of the beneficial use of federal funds that are now on the chopping block with the Trump administration, particularly funding for Superfund, Endangered Species Act, all kinds of fish wildlife service programs like Partners for Fish and Wildlife, all of these are on the block to be cut by 30% or more, to be defu defunded to a degree that they won't really work. And the Blackfoot's being held up as an example of how these programs not only help the environment, but stimulate local sustainable jobs, contractors who actually do the shovel-ready work that reconnects streams, plants willows, creates meanders, makes the fishing great. It's not just about the fishing, it's about jobs is the argument we're having to make and using the Blackfoot as an icon of that. Also in my own work, um, one of our big projects right now is trying to stop a mine in the headwaters of the Smith River there are stories recently that have been running that reference the Blackfoot in regard to that mine proposal. The Blackfoot as an example of the devastation mines can cause when they are in headwaters, the effort and years and money it takes to repair them, and meanwhile, the robust sustainable economies that can exist if you don't trash rivers. I mean, I could go on about examples of how the Blackfoot has been a model and we will continue to see more. I will, in my work, use it. I think, though, that there are still problems. It's not as if the Blackfoot is completely fixed, and I want to sort of wrap up with one of those that um, when I talk to folks in the Blackfoot, I hear more and more about all the time, and I think it's only appropriate to turn to Norman McLean to get a, an idea of of what this problem is and the roots of it, and also his prescience in seeing it coming. I feel like in this environment, when I'm opening this book, I ought to say, now let us turn to the good book, <laughs> page 73, and hear the word. <laughs> so it is on page 73 if you have a book. Um, I mean, this is at the end of a scene that the folks who spoke here before referenced that I think is one of the most memorable scenes on the river in the book. And this is how Norman McLean ended, or one of the ways he ended and reflected on what was going on in the Blackfoot. That's the way it looked then. But when I view it now through the sentimentality of memory, it belongs to a pastoral wor world where you could take off your clothes, screw a dame in the middle of the river, then roll over on your belly and go to sleep for a couple of hours. If you tried something like that on the Blackfoot River these days, half the city of Great Falls would be standing on the shore waiting to steal your clothes when you went to sleep. Maybe sooner. 
We don't have to turn to our neighbors across the divide in Great Falls as uh, you know, garment thieves to recognize that what McLean was really talking about was crowding of his home river, people from outside coming in to quite frankly do the same thing he did there. And um, many people from that area did there and still do there and value it for. Overcrowding certainly is becoming an issue on many of our Montana rivers. It's a difficult issue, especially from where I come from in Trout Unlimited, where we advocate for stream access. We're huge fans of Montana stream access law, partially which got passed because of interest on the Blackfoot of allowing people to access the river, as Jerry told us about last night. Um, you know, for people to care about a place they have to be able to have a personal connection to it, experience it, be on the river. We all get that, I think. But there's also the cliche of loving the place to death. And I, you know, some folks worry that we're heading in that direction with the Blackfoot. I don't have a simple answer to that, but I think by looking at the history of the Blackfoot and how it's been a model, not just for great recovery on the Blackfoot, but elsewhere, I trust that people in the Blackfoot and groups working with them will find viable solutions to this and other new problems as we move forward because those people are so deeply committed to that place. When I was thinking about this and thinking about the deep commitment to that place, um, I don't necessarily have the literary references that we heard before or the theological references. Um, I have a 14-year-old daughter, and so my references sometimes are diverse in a different way. And I was reminded of a passage from the Seattle hip-hop artist Macklemore in which he advises, advises, if you want to change the world, find something you love, do it every day, and the world will change. I think that's the message that is the deeper message from the Blackfoot story, the one, if you will, that is under the rocks that we all can embrace and hope spreads out into the world in the same way that restoration has moved out in the world from the Blackfoot. Thanks. I guess I want to take questions, if there are any, or comments. Yeah, I, I was intrigued by that, um, what you mentioned about high school students and alternatives to um, competitive sports. And that just seemed like a real rich possibility. Um, could you say a little more about that? Or are there any kind of initiatives where you try to bring that into schools? Well. With Montana Trout Unlimited, yes, and Trout Unlimited nationally, I can speak to that for sure. We run a kids fly fishing and conservation camp every year in which we have kids up on Georgetown Lake. They spend their entire days outside both learning or getting a crack at the art of fly fishing and using that as a window into, you know, you're fishing for these trout. What's that all about? Why are they there? Why are you using bugs? And getting a connection to the natural world and care for it and what conservation looks like. Um, that happens around the country with Trout Unlimited Kids Camps. Many of our chapters, one of their main priorities is getting kids to learn fly fishing and introducing them to conservation as alternatives to competitive sports. And I'm not saying there's no competition or no competitive element to fly fishing. I mean, you know, we all tell fish stories, and it's about size sometimes, right? Um, but I think we, most of us who do it, realize that's just the, you know, chatter over a beer after a day on the river, and that fly fishing is far more meaningful than that, and it does drive us to care about the places and pursue conservation. Does that kind of answer that? Thank you, David. Well, Maybe one more, Alan. So the, the passing reference was made last night also to the um, the corridor as a, uh, so to say, urban recreation problem or an imminent one. And for the Big Blackfoot Trout Unlimited, mm -hmm. can you comment a little more about 
about any possible mitigations here, uh, about crowd control issues. This is something that I've been wrestling with in a book I wrote about mountain climbing. Yeah. It's, it happens, does it not, in all sorts of uh, outdoor rec venues, and it is getting a huge problem. Yeah, I mean, this is the reason we have the cliche, we're loving it to death, about our national parks, about climbing trails, um, skiing, rivers, for sure. I think we have to step back in Montana a little bit and get per some perspective. What we call crowding looks like complete solitude if you're coming from the Arkansas Browns Canyon in Colorado, right? Which is to say we have an opportunity to be ahead of the curve and do some sort of management or figure it out before it gets so bad that it's actually damaging the resource and really damaging people's experience, right? Um, as to what's being done, well, the Blackfoot, the chapter uh, Blackfoot Challenge already have a drought mitigation plan in place that is, again, a model for other watersheds in the state of how to deal with drought, low times, low water, warm water times of year. And the reason that I, I'm using this as an example of some foresight on crowding is that part of triggers that are hit by low water or warm water include not only irrigators shutting off irrigation, but includes guides and outfitters and anglers voluntarily not fishing because that too is pressure on the resource. You know, when the water is low and warm, it stresses fish and a hook in their mouth and a long fight to the boat can kill them a lot more. It's, the mortality is much higher when they're stressed from low water conditions. That of course is not a solution to fishing all times of year and crowding, but I think it means that um, we're, we're looking at that taking it seriously. Right now there is a proposal in front of the Fish and Game Commission in the state for the West Fork of the Bitterroot because of this very thing. And the basis of it is that you divide up pressure. Guides can only be on certain sections certain days. They can't pound the whole thing every day. Um, I believe it's on the big hole. There are stretches where it's Montanans only, unguided. I think the Upper Beaver as well. The Upper Beaver Head. And so there are ideas about how to do this. Um, again, you know, guides and outfitters, if any of you are here, you'll say, well, our pressure is no different than, you know, me in a boat with my family. It's all pressure, and so why pick on the guides and outfitters? And that's a question we have to grapple with. And again, I think we have to grapple with it, keeping in mind that people need to have access to these places. They need to be able to love them if we expect them to care about them. So. That's not a straight answer. Like, I don't have a blueprint. But I do think we can expect, because of the people who are in the Blackfoot, that one of the blueprints for figuring this out is going to come out of the Blackfoot. Thanks. I just want to mention our sponsors. They are the help that we need to come together like this, and so they're really important. Um, Montana Film Office has helped us, um, Citizens Alliance Bank, Humanities Montana, the Montana Cultural Trust, Montana Department of Commerce, the National Endowment for the Arts, the CD Lake Community Foundation, um, Ariel Winston, who makes the rods that we use for fishing, and one of our own dear ladies, Betty Orr. Thank you all very much for listening. Um, I've got a pleasurable thing again to do to um, introduce Stefan Larsson, um, who comes from Sweden, a small town Alvdalen, and I probably have got that way out of pronunciation, which is in the central and northwest part of Sweden, uh, where he runs an Orvis endorsed fly shop, lodge, and guide service. Um, he lives in the middle of the Swedish countryside with the forests, rivers, and mountains, and he's a true Renaissance man, I'm told. 
He is a wild game butcher, photographer, regional fly tying legend, and he's walking up very quickly to the podium. So let me introduce <laughs> Stefan Larsen. Oh, thank you. Is this is it okay? You hear me? Good. Uh, I'm actually honored to be here, and I hope since you heard I'm Swedish, I hope I don't stumble too much on the English word since I'm going to do this in a, for me, foreign language. Uh, I was, a few words, uh, I, I'm, I'm about to talk a little bit about the book and the movie that we're all here for, a river runs through it, what impact that had on me personal as a fly fisherman. Uh, but also a little bit of the impact on, well, the rest of the community back home in Sweden, because that's, that, that's pretty far away from here, you know that, right? That's pretty way up north as well. So the biggest difference is being a fly fisherman. At here I could probably do that 11 months a year. At home I can do it six months a year. But that's why I had all those other occupations on the other side, being a butcher and uh, yeah, doing speeches about fly fishing and whiskey and all that stuff. And I'm, I'm also a chef. I got to earn money to keep that fly business going. Anyway, so uh, Sweden is not so different from Montana, actually. It's pretty similar. We've got a lot of woods, we've got a lot of rivers, we've got a lot of mountains. And what I like the most being here as well, it's my seventh year now I'm here in Montana, and it'll probably be seven more, and seven more, and seven more. Uh, that's, I once saw a map on Montana taken from space, a picture, and it was like one dot of light, and the rest was black. And it read just like we wanted. Sweden has got like three small dots, and Sweden is a very big country. The rest is black, just like we wanted as well. So anyway. So I was born next to a big trout river, and I was brought up there. Uh, my father took me fishing and hunting with my brothers every week, year round. Uh, so I was brought up that way, and uh, my father passed away when I was pretty young. I was 14. So my brother obviously got the guns. They wouldn't let a 14-year-old long-haired guy like that had a couple of guns. So my brother got the guns and I got the fly rods. So here I am. And it turned that way. But I, actually, I'm taking that back because uh, just before I left home, I've been here for 22 days unofficially, just before I left home, my brother signed over his gun to me. <laughs> yeah, so I'm getting there. Uh, so uh, it was a long and winding road, as many lives are. I ended up doing what I do today, fly fishing having a fly shop, having guide service. That's exactly what I want to do all my life. Uh, then, one of these days, it's pretty many years ago now, I can't remember. I'm getting too old to remember stuff. Some of you may, might recall that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I watched a movie on the TV, and it was called A River Runs Through It. Uh, by then, the amount of fly fishing movies wasn't that wide, at least not at home. You probably had more fly fishing movies than we had. So it was ju just reading about fly fishing. OK, you cancel everything. I got to see this. I sat down, watched the movie. When the movie was done, I was totally stunned. I was done. I sat there in my sofa. And I I'll never forget this. I sat there looking at the TV for another hour after the movie. I had no idea what I was looking at, none at all, because I think my vision stopped somewhere here. So I just realized, what is this? What is this? OK, I read about Montana earlier. I did that. But this took me like, a, what do you say, like a lightning from a blue sky. I didn't know what to do. Uh, so I was thinking about that movie. Oh, actually, I know what I did. Finally, I got, I got the movie on DVD. And I forget it, because I, bought, I, I, bought, I didn't buy one, I bought three. 
in case I would lose one or if I would break one. And then I bought a fourth one the day after, which I gave my brother. Because I know that he's much more careful with stuff and things than I am. He's like a taking care of things. So I know if I would manage to kill all three of them, I just go to my brother and pay him the double, or something like that, to get another one. So anyway, uh, of course, I realized there's a book. I got to read the book as well. So I got the book. And I might say that didn't help. It got worse. Because when you read the book, uh, I do write myself. And uh, I, I could feel like sometimes, for me, it was like when you see someone write, I usually call it the paint. If you can paint a painting with words. And that's something what Norman did for me. Because when I read that, I could see it all in front of me. So painting with words, something like that. So I, I, I was totally stunned. I didn't know what to do. Uh, but I also remember going out in the river after that. In Sweden, we don't have drift boats. We wait walk. If we have a drift boat, someone will shoot at you. <laughs> yeah, because we got, we got a lot of waters, a lot of rivers. There's a lot of shallow waters and shallow rivers, so everybody waits. If there's a boat coming, people are going to start like, throwing rocks at it and stuff like that. In the old days, before I was born, I remember they, they had like this first drifting tour, and that lasted about four and a half minutes. Then somebody pulled out a shotgun and shot the front end of the boat into pieces. So they had to roll it back. Yeah, that, that was the end of it. So we waited. And I'll never forget waiting one of these days after re reading the book. And I suddenly realized, like, that day I did more listening and talking than I did fly fishing. If I would say this to somebody else, they probably would put me in a strange place, because, I mean, so you were out talking to water all day? Yep. I still do. And the older I get, the more I talk to it. And the thing that got stuck in my head was this, and the rocks are words, and there are. I guess all of you know that. There are words under there. And you will hear them if you listen. So there I was in Sweden. Like the fastest trip here would be like 18 or 19 hours if I catch the right plane. So that, that, that's pretty far away. So how do I do this? Well, I got to go to Montana. I just have to go to Montana. So I rounded up a couple of friends. And we went to Montana and fished from 5 in the morning till 12 o'clock at night, every day, for 34 days. No, sorry, 24 days. We f fished and we fished and we fished and we fished. But of course, I couldn't get to the Blackfoot, because they were three and I was one. So that was always the, no, yeah, we have one car, we got to go there. OK. Uh, anyway, the second time I went, something strange happened, because uh, I went to the Blackfoot to fish. And it was actually, I went to the North Fork of the Blackfoot with a good friend of mine. And I caught my first cutthroat in the Blackfoot River on that day. It's still, it's on my wall in my living room, next to the film poster of the film, the river runs through it actually. Yeah. And it's the most beautiful fish I've seen in my life. It always has been and always will be. And I cannot remember this because my friend, who is like 200 pounds and 194 centimeters, is like they usually, when he's with me, people call him Gandalf and they call me the Hobbit. Because <laughs> I'm not that small, but next to him, I'm like, yeah. And he said something then. He said, like, Stefan, you know, this is the first time of all the years I've known you that you've been quiet more than five minutes in a row. And that, that put some word and some depth into what I was feeling by that time. I, I probably was very, very, very close to cry, fishing that, getting that first cutthroat. I'll never forget it. I, I can still hear myself, him laughing, and I'm going, it's a cut, it's a cut, it's a cut. God, it's a cut. That was my first cut as well. Yeah, so, well, so I did that. Uh, 
Then I got home, of course I had to publish those photos on the magnificent social medias like Facebook and Instagram. I put that picture out and uh, suddenly I get an answer from Montana, from Greeno. Uh, is that guy over there in the back, Jerry O'Connell, who... Oh, you're at the Blackfoot. I, I, you see, I'm kind of cautious when it comes to fishing. I've seen too much and I've seen too many things, so I never write where I've been. I write articles of fly fishing and people get back at me because I never write where I've been. No, I can't do that. Because all of you would go there. <laughs> and there would be no fishery. It's a little bit like we touched earlier. Yeah, too many people in the same place. Anyway. So I said, oh, you're on the North, uh, you're on the North Fork of Blackfoot. Yeah, I am. And we like started having a conversation on mail and on the computer. And it turned out like he told me, well, I'm here and I got this and I got that and the book and I'm on the R Blackfoot River Keeper. And I was like, oh, oh, and he's talking to me. Thank you, God. <laughs> he is talking to me. Uh, and I think he sent me a picture or something, and I sent him a picture back. Well, I'll come back to it later on. Anyway, so that, that, that was all by that time. Next year, I went to Montana again. There, there was, there's no stopping me. There was no stopping, there's no stopping me now. I'm going to continue to do that. And I, I was actually started in Colorado with my friend Martin, who's in the back there, and, uh, and another guy. And we fished Colorado for a couple of days. Okay, away we decided we're going to go up to Montana. Yeah, and we're traveling up along the beach route, and suddenly I get this message: "Hey, how would you like to fish the Blackfoot River? You can stay at our place, Jerry O'Connell." And I read it three times, I think, upside down as well, in case I didn't misunderstand anything. And I looked at at my friends, I said. Uh, that's my friend Jerry. He, he asked us if we want to fish the Blackfoot River with him or we could stay with him. What do you think? And that's his silence. Okay, they didn't hear me. So I look at those guys and I see two heads going. <laughs> no words, just. So we went up to Jerry, took really good care of us. We fished, or fished actually. We had talked so much about this book and, uh, uh, and the movie, and I know my friends are just as into that. And uh, he took us for an unforgettable ride. He showed us the places from the book. And when, and when you read the book several times, you see in the picture like, oh, the movie like 75 times, and you see this place in real. Oh, it's here. Oh my God, it's here. So it was an exquisite night. We moved around, looked, and then we come to this Hole, you know the one where Paul swims, swims with a big trout, and he's like, "Yeah, okay, so this is a hole where Paul swam with a big trout." So, who want to be first? <laughs> like, and you get three shy Swedish guys standing like. <laughs> but I got very, very, very good friends, which I love more than anything else, and they both like took a step back. Of course, it's you, Stefan. Okay, thank you. I remember taking that step, step forward. I got the line in my hands, I'm getting ready. And I'm standing there. A minute goes, I'm still standing there. And it goes another minute, and I'm still standing there. Something, I just can't do that cost. It's, it's, it's overwhelming, I can't do it. So I'm standing there, and so these guys, uh, <coughs> behind my back, oh, okay, sorry. And I do it, and it's probably the worst cast I did in my life. It got some and it's, it's all over everywhere. Anyway, that was the first cast. I think I somehow in my, the back of my head, uh, back of my head, before doing that cast, I, I think I saw myself like swimming downstream, hooked onto a big, 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 big blackfoot trout. So that's probably why. So, well. It was tremendous anyway, uh, doing, no, oh, I got to think. I lost myself a little bit here. Uh, so we did that. Well, it turned out good, and it's, it feels like coming home every year. It's like 
people say, where are you going home? Well, this is sort of my home. It's, it's my home away from home. Uh, so that's the impact on me, the book and movie had. I can also tell you shortly that I got so many friends, of course, in the fly fishing community in Sweden. Everybody has seen the book. I don't know how many read the film. Everybody has oh, everybody seen the movie, sorry. The other way around. Uh, and it's probably bigger than we think. Wait, we gotta realize that's that we gotta realize that's on the other side of the globe. And it's so very big. And I actually saw a picture, uh, Facebook again. When I was down, down on, uh, in Idaho, one of my friends, one of my flight time friends, he just put up a picture. So I'm redecorating at home, and I see this, oh, what's that? It's Brad Pitt's autograph and a certificate that it's authentic. And there's a banyan bug, and it says, I'm redecorating the wall in the flight time room. Uh, that, that, that pretty much tells the story of another, another guy way over there in the cold country where I live where I live. So that's about it, the impact on me personally. And how bad is it? Well, it might be worse than you can think. I hope you all can read, because I didn't know if I want to do it, but I will do it. So I, I will actually take my shirt off. Can you, can you read that? You want me to read it for Yep. Me? I am haunted by water. <laughs> that's how bad it is. Thank you. Comments? No. Thank you, Steve. We're, we're done? Stefan. All right. Thank you. We're going to break for lunch now. Okay. And um, we should be back here by about 1 o'clock. So it's 45 minutes or less to find some lunch. All right. Thank you.